not very often that we actually get a psychiatrist. Um, uh, Phil Gould, the psychiatrist, to come and, and share his knowledge and expertise with us. But it's not just his knowledge and expertise. Um, uh, generally, he has a very specific skill set, one that is very, very uh, valuable to us as researchers, and uh, particularly those of us who care deeply about human beings and the way in which they suffer, and how important it is to understand trauma and the impact of trauma on the human psyche and on the, the, the whole of the family. And, and uh, Paul is an expert in trauma and an expert in a, uh, yeah, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, EMDR. If you haven't heard of that before, you will leave this room today and you will remember it. EMDR, EMDR. And you'll never forget. And you'll be thinking, what is that? What is that? Right? And before you leave here today, you will know something about it. And you, well, your, your brain will be transformed after this event today. Never mind your whole psyche, and never mind, and never mind just your sort of general, general sense of well-being. And you will feel better as a human being knowing that people like Paul exist. And if you have a problem, if you have somebody who has a serious problem, a serious problem is trauma, that you will actually know after today that it is possible to unlock that person, to enable that human being to move from a position of, 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 of blocked, blocked thoughts or, or a position where they are constantly bombarded with images and memories and uh, of, of past events and they can't get past those, 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 those memories which keep, which keep troubling them, you will actually uh, know that this, that this process called eye movement desensitization reprocessing actually helps people to unlock memories, uh, re re reposition those memories or, or, or reprocess those memories in, the, in their brain and, and process them and, and put them into, into the background as opposed to them being uh, flashing images and, and, and sharp reminders of pain and previous uh, trauma. So I hope that's a, a, a reasonable introduction. That's got nothing whatsoever to do with Paul. He's <laughs> given me, he's given me a, there's, a, there's a whole big list of information. No, about it. no, no, but some of it's very, very, very important. Uh, as you know, a consultant to the psychiatrist. He's a visiting professor at this university and we're delighted to have him as a visiting Sorry, professor. Sorry, I'm showing my hand. Nope. And he also is, is, is actually, um, he's actually a supervisor for two of our PhD students that you may have already heard do the presentations. Uh, where we're looking at the eye movement desensitization reprocessing uh, and to enable them to deal with past trauma associated with birth. So he has been developing specific expertise in birth trauma. But the, the, um, uh, if that's enough, if that's enough, is that enough, sir? Is that enough, sir? <laughs> Take the stage. Thank you very much. Very, very, very well. We're delighted to have you. It's nice to be here. Whenever Marlene introduces me to somebody with a particular skill set and then trauma, it feels like I should threaten you now that I will find you and I'll kill you. <laughs> um, I've left some cards at the front. Uh, the picture in the back is actually by a local artist, um, and it's a picture called Jack and Donegal, which is a picture about her son uh, and his journey as he was coming out of depression. Um, it's a picture that I have in my office, but I like it, so it's in the back of the cards. Um, there's uh, some contact details on the card then, if there's any follow-up questions, if you have or whatever, or you can track me down through Marlene and stuff. Uh, I'm not the other Professor Paul Miller who lives in the, I think he's in the <coughs> Built Sciences or something like that. And we get each other's emails every now and again. I got invited to China on one occasion, but I don't think they really needed a psychiatrist. Or, well, maybe they did need a psychiatrist. But, <laughs> Uh, but uh, I wouldn't have been much use for the other things that they needed me for. Uh, who's actually heard of EMDR? Eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Hey, some people have who be. Who heard me speak in Derry? Up at McGee at the Mental Health Conference with just you guys? Okay, so um, what area are you working in at the minute? What's your topics? Can we just go around? I know some of your marks lead to school, so can, what area are you working in? Sedentary behavior, not their adults. Behavior in older adults? Okay. Trying to get older adults to be more active. Ah, okay. And physical activity and other kind of Okay, excellent. And then who do we have the back side of the wheel and policy? Um, Carmen Cleveland, yeah, general nursing. Okay. Yeah. Next to you, Carmen. Um, development of Sorry, I should say I am actually a bit deaf and not just saying so I'll just make up what you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, development on app for shoulder pain. Oh, I'm sure. Hi, I'm Michelle, and I'm going to be doing something around drinking and swallowing difficulties, like the cognitive impairment. Oh, okay, excellent. Um, I'm minus in head and neck cancer, and follow up after head and neck cancer treatment. Okay, great. 
Um, I'm looking at brain computer interface technology um, in um, disorders of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Jackie Gracie, I'm the course director for physiotherapy and I look at complex cases with more than three comorbidities and how physio impacts. Okay. I'm Debbie and my background is ICU but my PhD is about older people with mental health needs in emergency pre-hospital settings. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, Mark, do you have a specific area that's your uh, area of interest you're doing as well, and, and as well as looking after everybody else? <laughs> okay, excellent. And as Marlene was saying, I'm working then with, with midwifery, and part of the thing that we're doing is really looking at the work where if we look at world health and stuff and the role of poly nurses, where you have low and middle income countries where there's a lot of task shifting, and we're actually looking at training uh, midwives as experts in the perinatal period and training them then to deliver mental health interventions. Um, now, again, part of that, the focus has been in the past with low and middle income countries, but the reality is if you come here with a post-traumatic problem, you present to your GP, the time taken from you being in front of your GP saying, I need help, uh, to actually being sitting bum and seat in front of a therapist, could take you at least a year you know, and if you think of that in any of the other fields that you guys are working, you know, somebody presents to head and neck cancer, you know, great, you have cancer, um, yeah, you definitely need treated, we'll see you in a year. You know, we, we wouldn't find that acceptable in any other branch um, of, of life and health sciences, but yet it's supposed to be okay with regards to mental health. Um, and as my colleague who works in Geneva, and he's a health economist, Rolf Carrier, Rolf would say that delayed treatment is denied treatment. And hopefully you'll see today, um, part of what we're really going to talk about is a trauma-informed way of looking at mental health. I think that's really important, especially with regards to public health. We'll talk a wee bit about that. So I always start with this slide because this is a massive area. Um, I've been working in this area for over 20 years and I still have loads to learn. So, you know, being able to squeeze all that into three quarters an hour, and anybody who knows me, the challenge of talking for three quarters an hour is a challenge. So it's quite nice teaching here at home, because usually when I'm teaching in different parts of the world, they all go slow down. <laughs> uh, so but hopefully most of you are following me. If I lose you, just stop me. But I always start with this quote, the mind is not so much a vessel to be filled as a fire to be kindled. You guys have your own areas of expertise, so hopefully things that I say today, you may feel they're not immediately relevant to you, but hopefully it'll spark a few things and you may actually see how things can really work together. Um, my mentor and trainer is this chap here from the University of Worcester, um, Dr. Derek Farrell. Um, Derek and I teach together in, in different parts of the world. Um, he's just back from Iraq. This is a picture of him um, teaching and training group in Myanmar. Um, and again, part of the role that we have there is trauma equipping, in a sense that there aren't psychologists, there aren't mental health nurses. Um, at times we're working with um, identified people who are already involved in some forms of interventions in some parts of the world um, working with what we would call typically within the tribal system the wise woman um, sorry guys no bias against you but there's even more wise women than wise men um, so in terms of the people that we work with we're, we're often looking at skills that we're uh, equipping them with in those different areas um, EMDR is a, one of the gold standard treatments, and we'll talk a little bit about treatment guidelines, but not overly. Um, what I thought I'd do today is give you a bit of an overview about EMDR and sort of tag a case into that, so you can see the sort of cases that, that, that I work with and what we, what we see. Um, EMDR, don't worry about reading all of that, it's basically a blurb that says that it's a trauma-informed or trauma-focused psychotherapy. It's a psychotherapy that has eight phases, so it's a, there's a structure to it and three prongs. The three prongs are looking at past, present and future. It's all about trauma, okay? Trauma, if we look at the original meaning of the word, means injury or wound. Um, it's interesting because as we've looked at the underlying neurobiology of how the brain deals and handles with trauma, actually in German, anybody speak German? Anybody admit to speaking German? Oh, at the back, Paul, ein Traum? A dream. A dream. A dream, ein Traum is a dream. And actually what you'll see is that the methods that I'm gonna to talk to you about today in terms of EMDR, that because we're looking at it as an information processing um, therapy that engages what we know about the neurobiology as well as the psychological, uh, what some uh, 
uh, what some people have really said is a way forward and we're seeing a lot of things come together. We'll see how important dreaming is and actually some of what we do within the EMDR actually we believe uh, explains the mechanism of that. But like all good psychotherapies, it's built upon an underpinning system. And the underpinning system or model of explanation of, of how illness comes about is what's called the adaptive information processing model. Now AIP um, basically does three things. It explains pathology, so it helps to talk to the person and say, this is why you have obsessive compulsive disorder, this is why you have post-traumatic stress. Um, post-traumatic stress, what do you know about post-traumatic stress? Hello? <laughs> Don't be shy. What do you know about PTSD? E even if it's just the broadest sense of sort of movies or something, what do you know about PTSD? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So, so one of the key things there that, that makes EMDR different in the nosological systems is that there's, it's defined by what has happened to a person. So there has to be a trauma. Now the different systems, we'll talk a little bit about this later on, the different systems have defined that in slightly different ways. But effectively a trauma is something which is outside the normal range of human experience and involves a threat usually to the person, but we've extended that also. We know that it can be very traumatic for a person whilst there's no threat to themselves to sit and observe a severe threat to another and that that's very traumatizing. Again, that fits actually completely with what we've learned about neurobiology because actually whenever uh, we look at the work of mirror neurons, um, who's familiar with mirror neurons? Okay, so mirror neurons are basically these little structures in our brain that allow us to have an emotional resonance with the people beside us. If we look at work with chimpanzees, if we have a chimp from the same troop uh, and it's being punished in a separate cage, if we measure the brain activity, both apes have the same activity, but actually the activity in the observer is greater. So the one that's watching the suffering mate actually experiences the pain to a greater degree. And that makes sense when we think about it because what does that do? Well, it builds compassion, doesn't it? And it means that we want to relate and think about what's happening to our colleagues and our peers. And it helps um, a, a community to come together. And if you look at the work of people like Robert Sapolsky, um, who looks at that and looks at the primate work, what we see is an, an explanation for, it's not just nice to be a part of a tribe or a troop as a chimp. It's essential for life, and we see that in lots of other uh, animal structures, such as with wolves. So with AIP, it explains pathology. It gives us a way to tell the person why they're experiencing what they're experiencing. It directs therapeutic endeavor. In other words, it tells us what to focus our attention on as therapists, and lastly, then it's predictive of outcome. And a helpful way to think about this, because I like to think about stories and statements, this is um, a, a quote from Carl Menninger. Carl is one of the, the very famous family of Menninger psychiatrists in the Menninger Clinic, maybe some of you have heard of. Um, he effectively was an abolitionist when it came to psychiatric diagnoses, because what he effectively said is, everybody is so different. Um, everybody in this room could have depression, but really what does that tell us? It tells us about maybe some core symptoms but the bottom line is your depression and what exactly that looks like and manifests could be completely different to what Julie's looks like. And so what we've got to do is actually begin to look at things at a very individual level. And to sort of put that across, he, he stated this, which is quoted by uh, Helen Spandler in Asylum in 2006. An individual having unusual difficulties in coping with his environment struggles and kicks up the dust as it were. I've used a figure of a fish caught on a hook. His gyrations must look peculiar to other fish that don't understand the circumstances. But his splashes are not his affliction. They're his effort to get rid of his affliction. And as every good fisherman knows, these efforts may succeed. So whenever we look at a trauma-informed model, the things that we've traditionally looked at in a medical model in terms of what a person presents with, so in terms of post-traumatic stress disorder, that might be the intrusions or the flashbacks. Uh, in terms of other psychiatric disorders, it could be a depressive illness. It could be obsessive compulsive disorder. It could be addiction, gambling, um, alcohol, sex addiction. And whenever we look at these different presentations that a person has, they're not the problem. 
in a trauma model there the fish is splashing about they're an attempted adaptation to the problem the problem is a hook in the mouth and in our sense as traumatologists the problem is the original trauma because it causes a defect in the brain in regards to how that information is processed and then that process that unprocessed material acts a bit like a lens so I have very focal lenses if I look at you through the right part of the lens that's fine if I look at you through the wrong part of the lens or I try and read something up close up here then that's difficult but that's what it's like for a person with trauma they're constantly looking at life through a malprescription and think about how that would affect them if your lens if we look at somebody who's been sexually abused, if their lens says, I'm a bad person, I'm defective, just think about how that affects every relationship that they're going to look after. It uh, could be a partner, could be a friend, could be within an educational system and a teacher. They're constantly going to bring to that an understanding that says I'm defective. And so as traumatologists, we want to work to remove as many of those lenses that are uh, getting in the way of people seeing the truth of things and helping them to engage. Now, interestingly, the other brother, okay, so while Carl was busy trying to abolish psychiatric diagnoses, William Menninger here was writing the DSM the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. So he wrote the, the very first, uh, which was medical, this right, I think it's medical 204. Medical 204 became DSM-1. So well, one brother was saying, get rid of diagnoses, they don't really tell us that much. The other was giving us a very structured diagnostic system. So that must have been a very interesting Christmas dinner. From EMDR terms, we've got a model, we've got a way of explaining pathology. Well, actually, it's interesting because if we take a step back and look across and think about the different therapies and ways that you engage with people. Um, this chap here, um, probably most of you have never heard of him, Jerome Frank, Jerry Frank. Jerry Frank uh, wrote this book here, which actually his daughter came into work in mental health in the last edition was written jointly with him and his daughter. But um, Jerry Frank affected people like Irving Yalom and Todd Irving Yalom, who would have uh, developed group therapy and group psychotherapies. But what he did in his book, Persuasion and Healing, here was look at all the different therapies and said, what makes an effective therapy? You know, why are some things effective and other things not effective? And he looked at these four key points, and EMDR and the model also has them, that you have an emotionally charged relationship between the therapist and the person, that you create a therapeutic environment that you're working within, that you have a rationale or myth that provides a plausible explanation for the symptoms and that you then have some procedure uh, which helps to resolve the symptoms. So you can think about lots of different areas like EMDR or CBT or the mo perhaps the modalities that you're working with and you see how that can hold to be true. So it's important that whilst we have these different models, it is important, but the reality is if you have these things present, actually the specific model isn't actually that important. EMDR, as I say, has eight phases, and I'll outline these with the case example. But it basically runs through from history taking, which is obviously a generic thing. Preparation, again, pretty generic with regards to a phased approach to trauma and psychological trauma. The assessment is an assessment in the sense that you might think about it. Assessment in this term is assessing the target, so it's, it's actually finding the dysfunctional memory network. And desensitization then is taking the sting out of the tail and processing unprocessed information. Installation is putting in then the positive thought. Body scan is looking at the body as basically the most honest broker in terms of telling us about pathology. There's a lot of you guys working in the physical side of things. Um, Bessel van der Kolk uh, talks about the body keeps the score. And what you see is that there are people that I would have seen after road traffic collisions where they've lost um, maybe the person who was sitting beside them in the car has died. There's been fatalities or multiple fatalities. And I see whenever we treat the original trauma, what we see is that pain or that muscular discomfort that they've been attending physio or pain clinics for goes away because in part it's uh, actually a somatic flashback. So it represents um, that dysfunctional memory network. Now I've used that term a couple of times. A dysfunctional memory network is like a time capsule. So if we were traumatized now, if something happened, it's like the memory is a time capsule. All the thoughts, feelings, emotions 
action systems, belief systems go into that time capsule and then it gets sealed. And the problem is, if we dig that up five years later, if something you know, is similar to that trauma often digs up that memory network and we open it, then that's all the thoughts, feelings, emotions of us now, but that we're experiencing at that stage. It's perhaps more clearly understood if we think about a child who's sexually abused at age 11. If they're coming to see me at age 48, then whenever we look at the traumatic material, it's all the thoughts, feelings, emotions of that 11 year old. And the problem is, you know, how well does an 11 year old system cope with running the life of a 40 year old? They don't cope very well. So, and we see that now the, the functional scanning shows that actually this is what's happening. Um, in some cases, in extreme cases of what we call dissociation, you may actually find a, a person regressing into childhood when that trauma network is activated. One client who was a teacher who'd been uh, sexually abused by a family member, whenever she began to do her teaching practice, whenever she began to teach children that were the same age as she was when she was sexually abused, triggered that dysfunctional memory network and one of her colleagues found her hiding in a cupboard because that's what she did whenever she had been sexually abused and she'd completely regressed to that state. And although it sounds completely crazy, the reality is what's happening is totally meaningful. If we think about our fish in the end of the hook, because what she did was that system was triggered, so she did what she always did then to protect herself, which was go and hide. And that's exactly what she did now, but obviously that's a serious problem for somebody who's an adult who's supposed to then be in, in charge of children. So it, it really does have an effect. And that leads us back to um, the three-pronged aspect. We just remember the milking still. And it's in a sense of past. So we target the past events, the present. We look and target present day triggers and then the future. We work towards a future template. What would it look like? But equally, a lot of people often present with catastrophizations. No, I couldn't go into that situation again. If I ever do that again, I will dot, dot, dot. And that's just as relevant for you guys. Um, you might have somebody who um, is recovering from a road traffic collision. And you know they'll say, no, I can never drive again because I don't know if I could trust myself or I don't know if I could trust other people. It also may be projected catastrophizations about, um, well, no, I knew somebody, it's always this vague person, who had cancer and they had a horrible experience and dot, 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 dot. Those things have a real measurable biological effect on the person. So EMDR tries to give a structure. It, it also allows us to work in different ways. We can have what we call a telescoping approach, which is EMD, you've just had a trauma, a bomb has just gone off, the memory network is active, so we shift it. So that is eye movement desensitization. That's the, what Francine Shapiro, who developed EMDR, first described. EMDR was then what she moved on to in terms of EMDR was looking more broadly, it was looking at other networks that the person may have, but still very much focusing entirely only on the trauma. EMDR small r is where you could have a person with multiple traumatic experiences, but they come to you and your service only allows you to have six to 12 sessions. So you're able to then actually restrict it and work only on say, for example, the road traffic collision. Um, if the person has enough ego strength and is, is capable of doing that. But really what it's grown into now is EMDR therapy, which is an integrative psychotherapy that can link into part of an overarching treatment plan. Uh, and I'll show you a slide about that. So at this point, EMDR, it does sound a bit weird. Cause we'll talk about the eye movement piece of it. People used to think it was like hypnosis. Not, not uncommon because one of the sort of best uh, treatments of choice with regards to post-traumatic stress in the past, certainly around the work of, between the wars and the Second World War, um, was uh, one of hypnosis. But we see now there have been uh, more than 44 RCTs that have investigated the MDR for PTSD, um, early traumatic stress, so within the three month period, and then also looking at traumatized children. Um, 28 RCTs have valued its use in other areas such as depressive disorder, bipolar, uh, psychosis, which is my area of interest, um, anxiety disorders, OCD, substance use and pain. It's interesting to note that 75% of those studies have been what we call the standard protocol. So they haven't had to be a modified protocol. There are some modified protocols that are out there, but actually the vast majority when we looked at them within the RCT context, these were actually just using the standard model. So it, it really does speak to the strength of the model and how effective that can be. 
Um, the focus of treatment did vary across the different studies whenever we began to look at them, um, and there was various targets. But that's not surprising because again, what's being presented is going to be what's important to the person. And I see other um, guidelines and papers are beginning to show consistently that the most effective inputs um, psychotherapeutically are the ones that are the most tailored for that individual. And we see that in the, the um, uh, I think it was BABCP or you know, BPS's guidelines looking at the treatment of schizophrenia. So we can now sort of say EMDR can be considered as having established um, efficacy with regards to treatment of PTSD. Um, these other areas really are emerging and we have a lot more research to do. And I'm part of what's called the Council of Scholars, which is there's 35 of us um, international experts effectively looking at a strategy to put together um, uh, research uh, looking at these lots of different areas. And that includes multidisciplinary working. Um, there are some guidelines that are right there. You guys aren't particularly mental health, so I'll not labor the point, but basically ISTSS um, uh, are probably, whenever we looked at the guidelines, um, the most accurate and, and included the most appropriate studies um, published in 2018. A lot of these things are summarized in the Journal of EMDR Practice. If you want, what I can do is set up a Dropbox with some of these papers in it. Um, and then you, you can look at them if you're really super interested. But part of the thing that's interesting for you guys is that you're all looking at PhDs, you're all doing your, or have done your PICOs and stuff. Why some things were included and why some things were not included sometimes depended on how they, the approach that was taken with regards to the PICO. So at that stage, if we get it wrong at that stage, some of these things will never get into guidelines. And from our point of view now as Council of Scholars, we want to make sure that research is being done because it's expensive. I want to make sure it's going to be counted and it's going to be a part of it. So ISTSS guidelines are basically giving a strong recommendation for adults and children with a post-traumatic stress disorder. And then there's a standard recommendation for early intervention. Early intervention is less than three months, okay? The bottom line is, by the time somebody's sitting in front of me looking for help, what do you think? The average time that it's been since their trauma? How long would you say? Yeah, it's about seven years. So, you know, in terms of a lot of other illnesses, by the time people are coming with PTSD, it is already chronic. Um, and there's lots of different reasons for why that is, but, but people don't tend to present early. Um, APA guidelines were slightly different, but the issue here was although the APA published their guidelines in 2017, they based what they included uh, on uh, this um, University of North Carolina Evidence Practice Center, uh, which meant that nothing beyond uh, 2012 was actually included. So you've got to be very careful about whenever we looked at the guidelines and they seem to be so different, it, it, the question we asked as EMDR clinicians was why is it so different? And the bottom line is, is because the APA guidelines were excluding everything after 2012. And one of, well, the largest study um, looking at EMDR was completed after that date. So whenever we look at these things, sometimes what comes out the other end is a guideline, an international guideline, it can be a bit sort of disorientating but if you actually drill down or even better you have other wise heads that drill down and then tell you about it um, we can get an answer to that so it is a meaningful question to ask if there are different guidelines out there our, our local nice ones uh, again there's been some issues with EMDR seeming to be downgraded uh, recommended for EMDR only in civilian adults and then recommendations for children's treatment and recent events were conditional um, if you can tell me what the difference between civilian PTSD and PTSD resulting from childhood sexual abuse is, I'd be very interested to talk to you because neurobiologically it is exactly the same. So again, part of this is because the studies they looked at and the questions that were asked. But the point is that it is becoming now a much more interesting area and field of research. So whenever we look at it, Whenever I trained in EMDR, I was back here somewhere. And um, when I trained, I went to, we had like a sort of intensive research uh, study thing for um, 
uh, for the membership exams for Royal College and they were asking we all had to choose a psychotherapy to, to specialize in at that stage and because my mentor was interested in trauma uh, I got into sort of EMDR but I was down there with sort of crystals and caftans at that stage you know whereas CBT and everything was was much more so I was the lunatic fringe but look at what's happened you know we've actually seen a huge exponential growth and part of that's because we find it's effective it's been effective in it on the ground and so people want to use it this stops at 2017 and what it doesn't include is the two biggest areas of growth that are just starting and that is EMDR China and EMDR Africa probably in the next five years the total number of Chinese EMDR therapists will completely outnumber the rest of the EMDR therapists in the rest of the world together so we're starting to see a huge period of growth so this is why we specifically want to make sure that we then we look at it in a meaningful way and ask questions and ask the right sort of questions um, my journey I'll not go into this in a lot of detail, but basically I started off working in psychiatric genetic epidemiology, looking at the genetic epidemiology of schizophrenia. So for me, schizophrenia was a very biological illness. Um, I worked with Tony O'Neill and Professor Ken Candler, who's one of the modern architects of the DSM-3, and our team identified the genetic material as part of the All-Ireland group, and that was, the, that was the data set that found the first gene of risk for schizophrenia. So it was probably DSM-3, or it was probably the tightest definition, because in psychiatric illness, it's all about the, the phenomenology. What are we talking about? How are we defining it? And then I read a book by this chap who's Colin Ross. He's a psychiatrist based in Texas. He's Canadian originally. And Colin wrote a book suggesting that actually maybe it isn't as biological as we think. And that actually, whenever we look at it, that it can be treated with psychotherapeutic endeavor because largely I looked at it as a biological illness that needed medication, okay? Um, you guys as a general audience, how important is trauma, for example, as a public health event in terms of schizophrenia? Who would think that trauma is relevant to that particular group? What do you think? So w some of you may have heard of, have you heard of the work by Folletti? and the Adverse Childhood Experiences Research. Yeah, who's heard about that? Gives a wave, no. Okay, some. <laughs> okay, so Folletti's work came from Kaiser Permanente, and it was basically looking at a group of people with obesity, and he looked at the group who lost weight but dropped out, uh, and it began to look at actually the importance of uh, trauma. Uh, work done here by Mark, uh, Martin Dorothy and Mark Shevlin looked at trauma exposure. If you have three traumas before the age of 18, your risk of a pathology level psychosis, so one that gets you to see me, is increased by 18 times, okay? Do you think that that would be an important thing to teach people about, if, given the cost of, of schizophrenia? Okay, so do you think it's important? What about if I told you that if you have two more traumas, okay? So you now have five traumas, what do you think the increase in your risk is? So if, if three traumas increased it by 18 times, five traumas might increase it by, what do you think? 50. Somebody say something? 50. 50, any advance on 50? Somebody say something? Come on, guess. 75. 75, any advance 75? 90. 90. 90, no, 192 times. Now think about the areas that you work in. If you discovered something that if I exposed you to it in the first 18 years of your life, three times, that your risk of a pathology level illness in your area meant that that risk was increased 18 times. And if you were in, exposed to it five times, that actually the risk was increased by 192 times. Think about what that would mean from a public health perspective. Is it something that you would be interested in focusing upon? But yet in regards to trauma, we, there, there isn't that response. Now part of it is we've got to understand the sort of the, that there is a social and psychosocial dynamic to that as well. But it is very important. And the reality is something that we looked at as being a very organic thing, actually, isn't maybe as organic as we think. There's a very important um, environmental effect 
And actually, if we go right back here to these uh, black and white characters, I'm not going into this in detail today, but if we look at the history of it, at the time this guy, Eugen Bloiler, defined the schizophrenias, there were five other models for the same illness called different things, all based on trauma and dissociation. And the reality is, why did he talk about ignoring dissociation, which is the work of this French guy, Pierre Janet. He ignored it, and he said it was about this guy's work at the top. You might recommend Sigmund, or recognize Sigmund Freud. And the only reason that he did that is because Freud was popular, as most cocaine addicts are. And C.G. Jung and Freud were sharing letters at the time, and C.G. Jung was working for Bloiler. So it's, it's all about personal relationships. So it's nothing at all to do with the amount of research that was out there. The considerations of that, it's about who was popular. And so we ended up with an illness that actually has an important trauma aspect to it being completely ignored. And the problem is we still ignore it. And we've been treating it, and, and that, despite that, 100 years later, over 100 years later, we still have a focus on medications. And the reality is when we begin to look at work done which begins to look at the importance of voice hearing and psychotic symptoms. Listen and talk and listen and talk is what one voice hearer said. Or in the open dialogue approach, be with, not do to. When we show people that we accept their experiences are real, we help to restore human dignity and avoid the distinction between them and us. When we begin to do that sort of work and understand the effect of trauma, it makes a huge difference. And so that led me ultimately to the work of Marius Rom and Hearing Voices Network, and then to these guys here, sort of the EMDR, Francine Shapiro, who passed away recently, being the originator of the method. And then I put it in a book in terms of looking at EMDR and looking at how we can put that together as a meaningful way of treating it. So the phase one is really bog standard, so in terms of even what you do engaging with people. Okay, you get a clear history, you understand what's going on, you decide the context, you rule out neurological impairments that could sort of get in the way. You're going to take a look at safety factors, build rapport, do a good general assessment uh, and sort of get the understanding that allows you to move forward. Understanding their views, what's bringing them in. So this is a fairly generic thing, okay. But we learn this from the open dialogue approach. Has anybody heard of Open Dialogue, just out of interest? Open Dialogue grew up in, in Western Lapland, um, where apparently it's easier to phone up and speak to your psychiatrist compared to phone up and speak to your GP. So if you phone up, um, you immediately get a person who is nominated to see you or having your psychotic episode. They then phone around, get all your friends and family and the people that are important to you in your life, and they all sit down together in a room. And then they talk about your symptoms ask you to share about your symptoms and your experiences and then they talk about you um, while you're there and it's sort of like an extended network of thinking so that's very interesting you're telling us that you're hearing voices i'm i'm thinking is you know what has happened to you in the recent past that's made this change for you oh well i'm aware this happened and so people have these discussions and i say it facilitates the person's processing of information. And if we compare the open dialogue approach and the work in Western Lapland, what we see is that three years after psychotic break, people are medication free and return to work. That's very different from the rates that we have here. We have people who are being told, you're broken, you're on lifelong medication. And I've had patients referred to me who were starting to do important professional courses. They've had a psychotic break and they've been told by their GP or by a psychiatrist, well, you're not going to be able to do that. You know, why don't you think about basket weaving? And that's appalling, you know, because that's something that was out of date 100 years ago. And the reality is the patients that I've worked with, psychosis, that they can be well. Medication may have a role for a short period of time, but that they can be well and without medication and living full and productive lives. So this sense of just running through your history taking as being a thing you have to do, it's a bit like sort of psychological rape and pillage. It's not actually that useful and it's not helpful. So instead, Open Dialogue talks about the work of Francois Leotard, one speaks as a listener, okay? We all have friends who are, conversation is just really a gap in their speaking. 
They don't really listen to what we say. We all know who they are. You know, uh, well, you know, tell me about yourself. Well, enough about you. Let's talk about me. You know, and the problem is, if that's your therapist, that's not great. <laughs> okay, that's not great. And so, if we look at I like this. This was a colleague again in, in midwifery showed me this slide. This is the Chinese word ting. Has anybody seen this before? Now, now call, uh, Chinese words are made up of, of pictograms and they're, they're composite. Um, and so if we look at ting, look at what's there. Mm. To be present, to see, to focus, to feel. This is actually the, the, the kanji or the uh, kind of for heart. To hear and to think. Now, if you had someone who was ting, listening to you like that, how different would that be? How different would that be? Okay, so that's what I want you to think about. This is the sort of therapeutic engagement that we're really looking at, and it does actually bear fruit. So let's take a look at a case. This is a case by a guy, uh, um, Johnny Walker. Johnny and I have done a number of joint presentations together. Um, Johnny was, um, that's actually his real name, Johnny Walker. We did a talk and we called it Johnny Walker and the Rocks, actually, at his suggestion. Um, but Johnny presented with depression, um, um, severe anxiety, mood swings, flashbacks of a stabbing, okay? Interestingly, he also had in hospital, he nearly died, he developed necrotizing fasciitis and he lost the ribs over his heart. And uh, he was on a lot of analgesia, including morphine, and he had morphine induced hallucinations and was traumatized by them. Now, interestingly, in terms of the diagnostic systems, that wouldn't count for PTSD, or, or it would not have. DSM 5 now allows that, and ICD 11 now allows that to be traumatic. The morphine and just hallucinations, they weren't real things. They weren't a real risk to life, just because he felt they were. Um, but they were very distressing and actually were traumatizing for him. So he'd been dropped off by a taxi and he walked between two individuals who bumped him. And he just thought they were being rude and then he realized one of them had stabbed him. They then knocked him to the ground and uh, then tortured him, stabbing him some 32 times. Uh, one of them lacerating his heart. He was only saved because a passing car stopped, the guy jumped out, announced he was a police officer and the two guys ran off. Turned out he wasn't, but he gave chase and he actually apprehended the two guys. So basically serious chest injuries including a laceration to his left ventricle, um, necrosis of the chest wall, necrotizing fasciitis, led to substantial physical um, disfigurement over the chest. He was in hospital unconscious for three weeks, and this is important. People used to think if you're unconscious, you can't be traumatized. Okay? But there's an awful lot of data that's still going in. Okay? I'm sure you were taught, you know, just be mindful about talking to your patients because the last thing to go is hearing. Okay? Johnny's a good example of that. Okay? Johnny's a good example. No psychological sequelae for six to seven months. Okay? Again, this is what we call a latent presentation. And be mindful of that because for him, the trigger was, he meets with a plastic surgeon and the plastic surgeon basically says, this is as good as it gets, okay? It's not gonna get any better. Now, that was the trigger for him. So Johnny reached for the uh, most common therapists out there, um, Vladimir Smirnov and Jack Daniels. Uh, and Johnny Walker as well. And Johnny Walker as well, bit of self-therapy. So again, a lot of these cases, I tell them it's not an alcohol dependence that they're actually presenting with, it's harmful use of alcohol. If you're looking at ICD-10, that's F10.1. And that's an important thing because they're using it as a tool, it's just the easiest tool to get. If, uh, if cocaine or benzodiazepines are extremely easy to get, this is what we see we get. The problem is now with the culture that we have, a lot of you guys are younger, basically people are going on the internet and they're ordering whatever they want, you know? And you, so we've got to bear that in mind because these medications that people take, these are medications not just because it makes them feel good, these medications hit all the systems related to attachment and community. And again, if we look at what's happening in Scandinavian countries that take the addict, they bring them into a functional community, their recidivism and addiction is going down. And this is the work of uh, Johan Hari has popularized it in his book, Chasing the Scream. Anybody read it? Um, or the work of Gabor Mate, who's a Hungarian psychiatrist who worked in addiction. But the reality is, 
if you look at the work that they've been doing and work of things like, anybody heard of Rat Park? Any of you work sort of in addictions? No? Not really. Well, if you look at Rat Park, the chemical hook model, which is out there, basically says if you take enough cocaine, you get a chemical hook and then you need more and more and more and more and more, okay? And, and that's bollocks. Um, because the reality is, if we look at research from Rat Park, um, and this is work that was done again uh, ar around the time of Vietnam, actually. If you take a rat and you put it in the cage and you lace two, two things of water and you lace one of them with cocaine, the rat will drink the cocaine lace water until it dies, ignoring everything else. But if you put the rat in a community of rats with toys to play with, peers to relate to, the rats ignore the cocaine lace water. And if you look at that, the researchers said, but how can we ever repeat that with people? And what they actually showed, well, this has already happened. In the theater of war in Vietnam, the addiction rates and use, well, addiction rates, use of substances was huge. But the vast majority of people who returned from Vietnam in the theater of war to a community and a functional family gave up their drug use. The only ones who continued their drug use were those that were in a society where they were not welcome because the Vietnam War was unpopular. And so actually what we begin to see is what is important is actually community and connection. And it's how important that is as a function. So for Johnny, he was using what was available to him. Thankfully he didn't go down the route of anything else. When I saw him, he'd had a voluntary admission to Knock Bracken. Um, and I treated him with uh, EMDR. He had a screening session and three reprocessing sessions, which is targeting the actual trauma. And this is where we look at it and we say, well, this is about story. This is about the generation of story. And we are, we're creatures of narrative. Um, and it's a, it's a very important thing. We can look at the biology of it. But the, the reality is we now know the biology affects the genetics. And we can think about epigenetics. If we take a mouse uh, with the agouti gene, and a good mouse mother has lots of licking and grooming, and it takes away epigenetic silencing marks and you end up with a healthy brown mouse. Same genetics, but the mouse mother doesn't lick and groom. You end up with a fat, obese, white, diabetic mouse. Same genetics. So we now begin to have a better understanding that to have a DSM diagnosable illness, actually sometimes all we need to have is exposure. And Robert Sapolsky's work on cortisol responsive segments ha has spoken a lot to that. So when we actually look at somebody like um, uh, Johnny, the bottom line is that actually for him, depending on where he is in his life cycle in regards to reproduction, potentially if traumatized, within his sperm he could be passing on epigenetic changes. And we've seen this from the work by Rachel Yehuda, looking at epigenetic work in Holocaust survivors and in their children. Because what we see in the survivors of Holocaust um, uh, and their, their subsequent generations, their risk of diabetes has massively increased. But if we look at that in the context of somebody in the Holocaust camps, in the death camps, actually those genetic changes allowed them to cope in low a calorific environments. But the problem is in the Upper West Side in New York, that's not great. It actually makes you fat, obese and diabetic and shortens your life. So these epigenetic switches we're only begun, beginning to understand. So the history is we get a general background, not going to go into this in detail, and really there was nothing of any great significance for Johnny. We're always thinking about a person whenever we see them, that that trauma is extending into a community. It's, you know, Johnny was a part of a community and that had a big impact on him. Um, we're thinking about what he presented as and really at that stage under ICD-10 he was a good old-fashioned post-traumatic stress disorder and he also had a moderate depression. So in terms of um, his treatment, if we think about a general overarching way that we treat, um, what we're basically going to have is safety and stabilization, trauma processing and then integration. And whenever we treated Johnny, what we actually found was that he was able to completely resolve his post-traumatic stress symptoms with the three sessions of EMDR. Now, if we look at that, what might that look like if we look at a functional scan? Well, here's a husband and wife who were in a car accident where they witnessed a child burn to death, so it was a pretty severe trauma. 
they're both doing exactly the same thing. They're reading. We were driving down the road, this happened, that happened. But look how different their brains are. You don't need to be a neuroradiologist to see the difference. And what we see is in the husband, we see lots of activity on the left hemisphere. This is language center. This is what remembering is like. So this is, I remember being in the room with a lion, okay? But look how different his wife scans. He's doing exactly the same thing. That's the front of her head, that's the back. That is her visual cortex. That's, I am in the room with a lion. So whenever we begin to think about trauma and PTSD, what we see is that for this woman here, she could be 16 years after this trauma. But as far as her brain's concerned, this is happening right now in front of her. Not 16 years ago. Families, clinicians can be sympathetic for six hours, six days, six weeks, six months perhaps, six years, what about 60 years? I work with veterans from the Second World War who can still experience the death of a colleague beside them. These things are relived in the brain. And so EMDR helps to activate a memory network. A memory is not a memory of an event. A memory is a memory of the last time that memory network was activated. And so whenever that memory network is activated, and that's what EMDR does, it activates the memory network, but it makes it vulnerable to change and then it changes it. And so we move from this type of a picture to this type of a picture. Now actually at this stage, both have PTSD still, but at least like this, he can begin to link into other healthy memory networks that allow him to begin to process. And that's why what we're looking at in terms of the brain is what Einstein reminds us here. You can't solve a problem by thinking at the same level of thinking at which the problem was created. If you have 10 people and five chairs, you need to go outside of the room and find another five chairs. And we do that with that idea revision through the processing of information. Basically, how we do this is that I like to do things simply. So the eye movements and the bilateral stimulation, whenever we put it in, okay, it goes into this gray box, which is a part of your brain. This is the anterior cingulate cortex. The anterior cingulate cortex can be divided into two parts. We have the part which is the, the ventral part which deals with emotions and it gets switched off, so down regulated. It is a knock on effect on the dorsal part, which is the cognitive part. It gets switched on and then you get a, a feedback, okay? So whenever you're looking at a trauma, so if we think about the car accident, less and less emotional tone and more and more ability to distance and notice and think. Then that allows them to, to, to rationalize and link it in with past experiences. It'll always be a bad thing. You know, nobody's gonna turn around and say, oh, yes, that person was killed beside me, that, but I'm okay about that now. I'm not stressed at all. Normal emotions are normal. Um, Freud put it in a rather more negative way, which one of my psychoanalytic colleagues likes to remind me of. That Freud said the best we can hope to do with neurosis is to replace it with normal human misery. Um, it's not perhaps the most positive message you want to give a client, but the reality is it, it's not far from the truth. You know, crap things are still going to be crap. But if you can put them in context, then it gives you so much more sense of, of how you can work through that. And where we see that really having its biggest effect is during dreaming. Because we can look at something which happens during the day, okay? But actually, whenever we begin to process it and see it from a different perspective, we can see that things maybe look different and that maybe there, there's something else going on there. Um, if we look at what happens with regards to dreaming, um, what we can see is that EMDR, we say, works very quickly. And we say that one of the methodologies for how it works is about... Uh, what's happening in dreaming and sleep. And if we look that work by Marco Pagani showed that if we look at an, an average night of sleep, you have this sort of exchange that detoxifies traumatic memories uh, and memory systems. And that happens about three to five times each night. But if we measure that same activity and look for it during an EMDR session, same thing will happen 25 to 30 times. So it goes a long way to explain how EMDR is actually a reprocessing of memories. And then once we see that returned, um, then it doesn't come back. 
because if we look at the other trauma-focused model, it's a trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. And if you CBT trained or aware of CBT, Okay, so CBT, I mean, is a gross oversimplification, but uh, one of the ways we can think about it is this is the way that you're thinking and will give you a new way of thinking and you create an extinction model. I want you to choose this instead of this. And so then eventually that new way of thinking is the way you think about it. EMDR is more like digestion, that it takes the, the raw data and it processes it. So the original data doesn't exist. So in the work that I have with patients with schizophrenia and stuff, these people are basically 10 years, over 10 years now, down the line, symptom and medication free. Um, some of those cases now with the new ICD-11 complex PTSD diagnosis, I would give them that in preference. Why? Not because the diagnosis is that important per se, but if you have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, your likelihood of getting psychotherapeutic endeavor is pretty low. If you have a diagnosis of complex PTSD, you're much more likely to get it. And so some of these, again, are decisions that we're making, not because it makes sense from the label point of view, but because it, sometimes we're making these things the gateway to services. So that's a very quick gallop through EMDR, uh, with about half of my slides. Uh, so <laughs> this is always quite a good quote to finish on. So good old Douglas Adams taken before his time. I may not have gone where I intended to go, but I think I've ended up where I need to be. So I wanted to give you a bit, I think it gives us some time for questions. Um, any questions? <laughs>